let us now explain, uh, explore non-naturalism. We have been talking about naturalism, and in contrast, what is non-naturalism. Uh, let us explore, what, what do we mean by non-naturalism, when it is written as uh, being a break in the universe. Now, if you take a look at the screen, that uh, well, when we call non-naturalism a break in the universe, what does this mean? Well, as we knew that naturalism subscribe to understanding moral properties, or understanding uh, value properties, in terms of uh, natural properties. In terms of natural properties. And non-naturalism was, well, uh, making uh, value judgments, independent of moral properties. So, somewhere there is a, a disconnect between the world out there, and moral properties, that the naturalist perhaps fails to see. Now, let us take a look. Now, non-naturalism, uh, when we tra talked about naturalism, we talked about uh, uh, how, uh, we took utilitarianism, or hedonism as a case study, as a standard example, that well. If something that promotes happiness, and happiness is desirable, therefore, uh, anything that promotes happiness, which in itself is desirable, is a good. And uh, uh, contrary to that, anything that uh, uh, promotes suffering, and suffering is uh, undesirable, and therefore, suffering is bad. That was the simple logic of a naturalist. But now, let us look, what uh, currency, or what uh, weight, does the non-naturalist have. Now, let us argue, uh, uh, this meta-ethical uh, debate, between naturalism and non-naturalism, from a uh, non-naturalist's perspective. First, uh, this naturalism versus non-naturalism debate, uh, uh, is uh, significant in the moral domain, but also has its ramifications in other domains. For now, we will keep ourselves restricted to uh, how it is affecting the value debate. Now, what does it uh, uh, take, uh, for us to make a moral decision, a value decision? If we are describing, what uh, our likes, or preferences, or satisfactions are, or our uh, aim for happiness is, we are, uh, and basing this uh, paradigm, uh, for our uh, value framework, then we are perhaps naturalists. But now, let us take a look at this, rather closely. What is it, that we desire? What is it, that makes us happy? Now, if we are talking about, uh, say, uh, very uh, fundamentally biological comforts of, uh, of uh, food, shelter, safety. Well, these are essentially uh, natural properties, and uh, natural phenomena, and therefore, uh, the naturalist puts forth, that these are preferred over insecurity, insufficiency of food, or ill health, and lack of shelter. What we have frequently uh, uh, referred, as essential uh, requirements for human life, even animal life. Now, this is how the way the world is. Is this, how the way the world ought to be? Now, this is a significant uh, difference in the two questions, that will perhaps, bring out the difference between naturalism, and non-naturalism uh, debate. Let us take a look at the board. This is the way, the world is. This is the way, the world ought to be. Now, if these are the two uh, sentences, or propositions, that we take into consideration, that well, well, uh, instead of x, if we write this as 
uh, this we write this as x and then we write y. That this is how the way the world is and this is how the way the world ought to be. Now, what is it the way the world is? Well, x is that we prefer health over disease. Now, when we talk about this, that we prefer health over disease, is this a naturalistic claim or a non-naturalistic claim? Well, definitely it is a naturalistic claim, it is not a non-naturalistic claim. Well, preferring health over disease is the way we are built, the way we are. That is, it is the way we are. But let us look at, uh, 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 let us further generalize it, that we prefer, server, which will perhaps indicate, what is the difficulty that we are likely to come up across. We prefer survival to death. Now, this is the way things are, that we prefer survival to death. And this is again, a naturalistic claim. Now, let us hold on to this, as the third claim. We have three claims, the claims here, one, two and three. Now, when we talk, when we prefer survival to death, it is a naturalistic claim, right. Now, if we prefer survival to death, now let us try to imagine a situation, where this is not true. This is not true, in the case of a uh, say a martyr, a soldier, who is out to fight a war, and does not care about one's, uh, his own or life, or her own life. Now, when, uh, or say a doctor, who is uh, operating in adverse circumstances, and uh, exposing himself or herself to infections, which could, which could be fatal. Say, in a famine affected area, or in a riot, or in a war torn country, uh, doctors go in, where the operating conditions are far less than, uh, what it should be. So, and this makes the operating staff, the medical staff, vulnerable to uh, numerable risks, uh, and infections, which could also be fatal. Now, in such a case, we see that, uh, uh, suppose we assume that the doctors, or the operating team, or the medical team, continues with its work, exposing oneself to this risk. What could be the justification for it? Now, when uh, the reason why I uh, make this claim is that, well, we see that there are numerous counter instances of what is basic naturalistic survival uh, code. Whereas there are innumerable violations of this, if I may call basic natural survivalistic code. If each one of us, or e human beings, are endowed with such a thing as the basic naturalistic survival code, what about its violation? What is the justification for it? Or what could be the justification for it? Now, it is here, that the wedge, or the gap exposed, uh, here, that the gap is exposed, for the non-naturalistic, or for non-naturalism. To enter. How do I say that? Well, the gap, uh, it is still a we are talking about this particular example, well, that each one of us has a basic naturalistic survival code, and 
the violation for uh, this has been frequently seen or throughout the history of human civilization. We took two instances, we took the instance of the soldier fighting, who uh, definitely uh, survival for him would be better to withdraw. And uh, uh, the medical team in a uh, war uh, uh, stricken area with minimal uh, hygiene and uh, suitable medically, oper uh, medically operating conditions, still going in for their duty. Now, here uh, they are doing something, which is clearly a violation of their basic naturalistic survival code. This is an example of naturalism. Why do they do that? We, the na uh, naturalism as a meta-ethical claim, is a description of the state of affairs. It describes how things are, but does it make a claim about how things should be? Now, this is the crucial distinction, that we need to keep in mind. Naturalism describes, how things are, but can we infer, from this, Can we infer from this, how things ought to be? Now, it is this crucial link, that is questioned by the uh, non-naturalist. That well, uh, naturalism on the whole describes, how things are. But from this, can we thereof infer, that how things ought to be? The non-naturalist's answer is, no. Human behaviour, has in numerous exceptions, to the basic naturalistic survival code. Now, this, these exceptions, inf uh, infer, that there is another paradigm. These exceptions, may be taken as to infer, that there are other paradigms, to arrive at moral decisions. And these paradigms, whatever they may be, may be non-naturalistic. So, uh, as we see, naturalism was about describing, or it is a description of the state of affairs. Non-naturalism, was about prescription, or prescribing the right thing to do. Now, it is here, that the crucial difference strikes us. Now, this is an interesting uh, meta-ethical issue, that we need to explore. That well, uh, naturalism describes the way things are. We know, that well, perhaps, if I leave that mobile phone in that crowded uh, train compartment, and come back in five minutes, it is going to be stolen. Somebody is going to pick it up. However, that this will be the case, there is no guarantee of it. Just as uh, uh, we may say that, well, if I uh, switch on the mobile phone, it connects to a network unless until its uh, programming and hardware malfunction, this is how it will happen. However, in the case of uh, uh, leaving the mobile phone in a crowded train compartment, and then uh, coming back in five minutes to check whether it is there or not, 
we can never be so sure. Why can we never be so sure? Now, I am taking the non-naturalistic uh, philosopher's perspective. Well, we can never be sure, because human nature has that uh, break in the universe that we have talked about. That perhaps, uh, naturalism gives us our goals, but what actually makes us act, is not how uh, we are equipped biologically or psychologically, but also how we reason, reflect or our values. That we are not a passive recipient of uh, uh, the information or uh, that is all around us. It is rather uh, a proactive uh, uh, assimilation, manipulation and reaction to what information is uh, available to us. So, the non-naturalistic philosopher makes a claim that, well, uh, the moral domain is a break from the naturalistic domain. That the moral domain is no more uh, uh, continuous to the uh, natural domain. Let us take a look at this. If we have uh, 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 understood all the naturalistic facts about a case, does that, or a situation, does that uh, give us uh, enough credence to predict the normative discipline, right? And this is what makes it uh, different from uh, uh, other disciplines. Every, every discipline has a normative part, right? What is this normative part? It comes from norms. And where do norms come from? Uh, a description or a natural order is a description. And can a description of the state of affairs be a prescription. Now, this is where the question uh, is that, where uh, the non-naturalistic philosopher comes in. That, well, uh, as long as there is a, a, a description it is insufficient to explain the goal. Where are we going to go? Now, um, take, take a very naive analogy to this. Now, if I describe the road to you, and you want to go on a travel journey, well, that is definitely not giving you the goal, that where you would like to reach. Prescription is like the goal, the norms. Every discipline, be it uh, the market system, be it uh, engineering, be it the medical profession, be it research, in any field, uh, has to have a set of goals. What is uh, frequently understood, or frequently uh, mentioned as the motto, the theme statement, the philosophy of an organization, of a discipline, of a goal, of a, of a subject, of a, a laboratory, of a, a project. It is the direction given to it. See, the philosophy of a, a uh, the constitution of a country. That what is the goal? Where do we ought to go? Now, describing the way things are, is insufficient to arrive at a goal. We have a goal, and a goal that way, is not a result of mere naturalistic uh, phenomena all around. Let us say, a, a leader dreams of peace, and uh, 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 born homie in a war stricken country. Now, this uh, leader is thinking, or, or uh, having a goal, which is separate from what is all around him. Somebody who is perhaps born and brought, brought up in a, uh, a war st uh, strife zone, war st uh, stricken zone. How does, uh, does that make one uh, be okay with the war? or that human beings have this ability to step aside from the perspective that they have been uh, raised in, and uh, have a less perspectival look at the way things ought to be. 
the non naturalistic philosopher counts on this break in the uh, universe. What is the break from the naturalistic order to the human uh, reaction to it, that our reaction is not a mechanistic determined continuous chain with the way the world is. So, uh, the uh, non naturalistic philosopher answers this as no, this is not possible. So, norms have to come from somewhere else, but definitely not the current or the naturalistic description. So, it is here that the non naturalistic philosopher makes a claim that ethics as a moral inquiry is a normative inquiry. Ethics is normative and the normative part of every discipline normative part of any enterprise or discipline or project is not a result of of what things are of what or uh, of of the way things are but of the way things should be. So, this is what the non naturalistic philosopher is trying to say, that the normative part of any discipline, not just ethics, any normative claim is not a result of the way things are, but of the way things should be. Let us say, if I am a banker and uh, let us say, if I am a banker and if I require to um, reform uh, the banking system and I have a vision that well, uh, it is normal for uh, uh, the customer to uh, uh, say uh, wait in a queue for, for the uh, teller to look into his requirement or if the teller can use his or her discrimination to decide on which customer to tackle first. Now, these are the way things are and maybe in many parts of the world, that is how things are, but perhaps if, if the uh, manager or if the uh, banker decides that well, this is not the way I want things ought to be. I want people to be seated or a chronology to be followed or uh, a one to one tackling to be done. These are instances where uh, the non naturalistic brick is visible. Now, you can easily correlate and compare this with uh, leadership theories, with management theories, that what is it that makes a manager or a leader different from uh, the rest? Well, it is the ability to have a vision and the vision just does not come as a part of the description of the state of affairs, but as a projection as how the leader or the manager wants things to be. Now, wanting things to be in a certain way can definitely be a non naturalistic uh, uh, claim. It need not be a result of the environment one is exposed to. It is perhaps somehow uh, 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 dependent on, uh, if I may say, uh, sparking out that inherent uh, uh, thoughtful creative uh, uh, streak in a person and where it is a, uh, uh, this uh, leader or the manager breaks with the naturalistic order and imagines, tries to imagine how things should be or ought to be and thereof restructures policies and goal uh, policies and procedures and uh, motivational uh, levels to attain that. So, ethics as a discipline uh, to a large extent depends on the 
distinction between the non-naturalistic order and the naturalistic order. Because, when we try to understand ethics in terms in the naturalistic order, we are actually uh, reducing ethics to, uh, to uh, may be sociology, to be psychology, may be to social anthropology, to culture, to various other natural factors. And thereby, uh, there is nothing inspiring or there is nothing uh, prescriptive about ethics um, as or a normative uh, inquiry. So, whenever we are prescribing something or giving goals, it is definitely not a mere act of description. It is an act of having a vision and sharing it with the others. So, ethics, uh, uh, the foundation of ethics as a discourse uh, is a part of every other discourse. Uh, or found, uh, ethics in any other discourse that is found is definitely normative, and normative makes it uh, almost. If you take a look, normative tends to be better explained as non-naturalistic. Okay. Now, we talk about the next uh, issue that we would like to tackle, which is realism. Now, realism is closely tied with uh, both naturalism and uh, non-naturalism. As we have earlier understood uh, that uh, and talked about that realism claims that well, entities exist irrespective of the perceiver. Now, what does this mean in the moral domain? That, uh, there are some moral values that exist. Uh, uh, um, independent of human perception, let me put that down, that exist independent of human perception, something perhaps like the uh, platonic values. Well, not exactly, rather more accurately, it is that there are moral facts. And this is what is meant by moral realism. Okay. Now, having said that, let us quick uh, briefly go over what is being meant by this. Well, first, when we talked about realism, we talked that uh, realism means that uh, entities exist independent of their perceiver. What it simply means is that, well, this green board over here exists even when I am not seeing it or when anybody is not seeing it. So, this was the realist uh, domain. I mean, it seems to be uh, pretty obvious that, well, things exist even when nobody is there to perceive them. Well, no. On the contrary, the idealists have claimed that, well, everything is either created by the mind or conditioned by the mind. So, we uh, say something like a prejudice, something like an idea, and uh, that say, uh, people of community X have Y property. Now, this is almost a uh, prejudice. Now, what makes this prejudice, is this prejudice real? Well, no, it is not real as we understood realism, because it exists in the mind of the uh, one who has this prejudice. So, idealism or, or uh, uh, um, goes ahead to claim that well, uh, these ideas are dependent on uh, the ideator, and uh, there is nothing uh, independent, uh, uh, existing independent of the perceiver. But, that 
debate does not concern us now. What concerns us is uh, moral realism. That what do we mean by realism? Does it mean that there is, because Plato uh, was a moral uh, realist of a sort, who almost deified moral values. And uh, by saying that, well there was this idea of justice and goodness, which exist of hum uh, independent of human perception. And our aim is to, uh, uh, we may never be able to know it, we can only know the semblances of it. So, there was this universal idea of justice or good, you see a series of uh, uh, just acts and you infer that, um, this is what is meant by justice. So, we can give examples of just acts, but we cannot, perhaps we are uh, finite enough, limited not to know, uh, describe what justice is. So, that was the Platonic claim and went further ahead to say that, well, uh, justice, goodness and all these moral values existed independent of human perception. Well, we should not, we, we do not now go so far ahead to make um, um, such claims, which in today's parlance would almost be mythological, of making, uh, of, of uh, postulating entities such as the ideal uh, good or justice that exists independent of uh, human perception. Whereas, as we noted on the slide, it was written that, well, moral, that there are moral facts, that is what do we mean by a moral realism, that there are moral facts. And as long as there are moral facts, that means, th there is something objective about morality. And they are not just uh, opinions of uh, agents. So, that is what is meant by realism in the moral context. Now, there is uh, realism traditionally held that things are in themselves and it does not depend or uh, is not perceived by a mind. Now, who are not, let us go uh, uh, into some examples of who are not moral realists or what is uh, against moral realism. Well, first is the skeptic. then is the nihilist. Uh, the skeptic questions, unendingly, about the possibility of knowledge, possibility of moral knowledge in this case. The nihilist, on the other hand, denies the possibility of knowledge at all. So, when people who are schools that make a claim that there can be no objective talk about morality, are not moral realists. So, to be a moral realist, well, one has to be an objective, uh, objectivist about moral claims. Now, there has been a lot of debate between realists and skeptics, that has been put forth by an interesting example, uh, by a western philosopher, which talks that, well, uh, let us look at it this way. Now, if we require, uh, uh, when I talk about moral facts, what am I asking? When I say that, well, uh, uh, when I make a moral claim, it has to be acceptable to others. Uh, and, the very attitude, that there can be a moral claim acceptable by all, talks about moral uh, uh, realism. Um, an interesting example is uh, put forth, uh, that well, when, when we talk about, uh, uh, this example brings forth, uh, tries to diffuse the attack of the skeptic on the uh, uh, moral realist. Uh, uh, the skeptics asking, to show that, where are the moral facts, is analogical similar to, uh, my asking, or to anybody's asking, that, 
give me the address of the average uh, Indian. Now, there is a notion called the average Indian, let us say, the, uh, uh, there, there is a notion of averages, there is a notion of uh, uh, average Indian middle class, say average Indian income, average uh, uh, Indian uh, psyche. But now, when I ask the address of this average Indian, where does it come from? Now, this is what the moral realist uh, replies to the skeptic, that well, when you ask for the location of moral facts, you are actually asking a question that cannot be answered. You are asking a question like, give me the address of the average Indian. How can I give you the, clearly it is uh, nonsensical to attempt even giving the answer of the average uh, Indian, because it is an average, it is not an individual. So, when I say that, uh, uh, there is a moral fact, it does not have to have a location to be a moral fact, it is a moral fact by itself. Now, what does moral realism uh, depend upon? Now, moral realism depends a lot upon our notions of what obje uh, moral objectivity is. Now, Whenever we have a moral uh, uh, discourse, a moral claim, or a, a simple difference of opinion, let's take a uh, take an example. The school, or a school, has raised its fees ten folds, and two students talk. Student A says that I don't like uh, the school raising the fees it is too expensive, uh, and now it becomes uh, painful for me to pay. The second student, student B, is saying that, well, they were wrong in raising their fees. Now, the student A's claim was an opinion, where he clearly expressed his or her dissatisfaction with the uh, new move of the school, to uh, hike the school fees by uh, ten times. The claim of student B, was closer to moral absolutism, was a judgement, a judgement that need not be uh, uh, confined to himself. So, he is making a, what is perhaps can be called a moral fact, which is of course, judgeable and uh, revisable, but B's claim indicates that, well, there can be a uh, objective moral judgement on an act. Now, the act here is the schools raising the fees ten times. Now, whether that is right or wrong, uh, it uh, student A expressed his opinion. So, let us say, somebody in the management C, person C, expresses his opinion, that well, I feel very happy now, that um, the fees have uh, been raised to ten times, have been hiked by ten times, and now, we will get good salaries. Now, these are very uh, uh, if I may say, uh, selfish or uh, person specific perspectives. But if uh, the newspaper editorial, the journal or uh, student B is claimed that, well, the school is wrong in hiking the fees, is an indicator or a step towards a moral judgement. The student, uh, this, uh, assuming now that the school comes up with its justification that, well, it is for these reasons that we raised, uh, uh, hiked our school fees. And if these justifications, seem strong, or uh, uh, reliable, or uh, uh, robust, then, from a neutral perspective, one can uh, judge, whether the uh, hiking the school fees was right or wrong. Now, this may uh, sound a little ambiguous, but is not it what we do every day in our lives? Is not this not an option, when, when uh, uh, the governments judge uh, policies, when, when the courts judge the cases. So, uh, we are actually assessing, that we are assess uh, going ahead with the claim, that well, uh, we can find a moral fact. Let us take a look, what is the structure of this uh, claim. Now, 
moral realists, believe that there are moral facts. How do we arrive at them? Is a question that is to be tackled next. So, uh, uh, most moral realists tend to be fallibilists. That is, they believe that there is a moral fact, but how to arrive is the question. Whereas, someone who is not a moral realist, no moral facts, that means, there is no way of arriving at moral facts. So, this question does not hold any value for the uh, moral realist, uh, for the person uh, or the philosophy or the school, which is not a uh, moral realist. Now, this is the crucial difference. Now, the moral realist, uh, one who is denying moral realist, is more likely to be a relativist or a nihilist. Whereas, someone who is a moral realist, is going to accept moral facts, but the effort is to find out, to describe this, to describe this paradigm. To arrive at the claim. So, a moral realist can also be a naturalist, that is to be noted. Can be a naturalist. How do you say that? Well, a moral realist can be a naturalist, because this paradigm is answered by naturalism. Um, so, we have talked about uh, moral realism, and uh, what, what does it take to be a moral realist, and what is, does it take to be a non-moral realist. Uh, 